Good evening and, and welcome everyone. It is uh, my great honor on behalf of the alumni of New York University to welcome you here tonight. Tonight we have a very special program in a couple of different ways. Um, the LAA puts together this fall conference every year and um, <clears throat> we choose to work with student groups. Um, we feel that the students, the alumni of this school start on the day that you matriculate. So we feel <laughs> very, which means you can get hit up for donations. Um, so <laughs> so and we, we feel that working with them really gives us insight into the student population and uh, the alumni body. So we also have the honor tonight of, of honoring one of our own, Judge Kay, um, who really was a remarkable woman uh, and achieved remarkable things in her life. We will hear about those. I, I wanted to reflect on one thing that I read uh, about her, or that she wrote, um, just a year ago in, in August. Something that I think can inform all of us at this moment. So to, to paraphrase, she was writing about the problems with our justice system for the New York Times, and she wrote, and I think this applies to what a lot of us are feeling, what next? Clearly, protests are not the answer either. Far better are continuing positive, problem-solving, restorative justice solutions. It is for us to fulfill the promise of America as a land of equality and opportunity. And I think those are important words for all of us to remember right now. Uh, I'd like to thank the co-chairs of the Fall Conference Committee, um, Jerry Gomez, Stephanie Wolf, and Alan Klinger. I'd also like to thank the Law Review for partnering with us. And at this moment, I'd like to uh, introduce Maybelline Mena Hadika. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Maybelline Mena Hadika, and I'm the editor in chief of the NYU Law Review. The Law Review partnered up with the Law Alumni Association to co-host this very special event in honor of Chief Judge Judith Kay. When we were approached uh, to co-host tonight's conference, we enthusiastically agreed. As students of her alma mater, we are so honored to be part of this event that recognizes her judicial legacy. Um, the Law Review special tribute issue will be published in April 2017, volume 92 of the Law Review. Um, we have so many wonderful authors contributing to this special issue, and I would like to thank them all tonight. Um, thank you to everyone who wrote a piece. Uh, Judge uh, Albert Rosenblatt, Chief Judge Jonathan Lipman, Professor Sylvia Law, Professor Helen Hirschkopf, Professor Stephen Gillers, Professor Oscar Chase, and Roberta Kaplan, and, and our introduction, which was written by Dean Trevor Morrison. Uh, I also want to personally thank the Law Alumni Association for their collaborative partnership and the, their hard work in putting on this special event tonight. I want to thank the members of the Law Review, especially the article editors who are currently working to edit Judas Kay's uh, tribute pieces, Annie, Sam, and Russell. And um, now I would love to introduce our fantastic Dean, Trevor Morrison, who has been so helpful and supportive of the NYU Law Review. And uh, we, without him, this event wouldn't be possible tonight. Uh, thank you so much to the Dean and to everyone uh, for attending tonight. Um, and now, uh, please warm welcome to the Dean Morrison. Thank you. Thank you, Maybelline. Uh, welcome to all of you to what I think will be a really interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, this is not a memorial for Judge Kay. It's a celebration of her life and work, um, and certainly the way I think that her, her ongoing influence on the law, on this institution, continues to be demonstrated is that there's so much to think about, so much that she did, so much that she contributed to the law uh, in legal doctrine, to legal institutions, um, to the way judging is done, and we'll hear about a lot of that uh, uh, tonight. I do want to uh, welcome all of you. I want to say a special welcome to Louisa and Jonathan, Judge Kay's children. We're so glad that you're here with us. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting uh, us in this event tonight. 
And thank you also for your partnership in something I'm really thrilled to announce tonight, uh, which is the law school's commitment to work to establish a scholarship in Judge Kay's honor, the Judith S. Kay Scholarship. Uh, the school working with the Kay family and many other uh, supporters, friends of, of, of Judge Kay, former clerks and others um, have already made commitments to uh, help fund this scholarship. It's an ongoing effort to do that. Um, but the scholarship will be designed to bring to the law school and to cover full tuition for a student uh, committed to working in the area of LGBT rights. As you know, there are many areas in which Judge Kay was absolutely a transformative figure but her work on the court in that area uh, stands out as especially important, and we celebrate that and her legacy through this scholarship. So I want to thank the many of you here who have already committed to support our effort, um, including Louisa and Jonathan, and many others here, uh, to support our effort to establish the scholarship. And um, we ha you have an insert in your programs uh, noting that the many people who have already pledged support uh, to this effort were thrilled by it and really look forward to uh, completing the task uh, of funding the scholarship so that we can offer it as soon as possible. Um, I'll be back in my moderator uh, role in a moment to kick off the panel, but first I want to introduce Casey Hemphill, who's editor-in-chief of our Moot Court Board here at the law school. Casey? Thank you. Thank you, Dean Morrison. My name is Casey Hemphill. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the NYU Moot Court Board. And on behalf of the Moot Court Board, I would like to express sincere gratitude to the Kay family. Due to their generosity, this year we established the Judge Judith S. Kay Writing Competition, opening the Moot Court Board casebook to external institutions for the first time in its 40-year history. The Moot Court Board casebook is a collection of legal records and bench memos that has been written by students and is now open to faculty, and is used by law firms as well as hundreds of legal research and writing programs across the globe. For the inaugural year, we received 12 entries, and a panel of Moot Court Board staff editors selected five finalists for faculty review. We will announce the prize winners in the upcoming weeks. Thank you so much for your support in allowing another group of problem writers to achieve the mission of the Moot Court Board exploring new approaches to unsettled legal questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Casey. And so um, we'll get going with uh, what I know will be a really interesting panel conversation here. You have biographies of our terrific panelists in the program, and so I'm not going to uh, take time away from substantive conversation by running through those. But as is obvious, this is an incredibly distinguished panel, uh, starting with Helene Barnett, NYU Law Class of 1964, um, who's uh, just had a storied career working in so many capacities, including, of course, as president of the Legal Services Corporation. Also with us is Steve Kong, uh, chief counsel to the Economic Development Administration and a former clerk of Judge Kay's. Uh, Judge Al Rosenblatt between Helene and Steve, uh, formerly judge of the New York Court of Appeals and colleague of Judge Kay's there. Um, now, among other things, a judicial fellow here at NYU School of Law, where he's a much celebrated teacher. Um, we have also Lisa Schweitzer, NYU Law Class of 1996, a partner at Cleary, and another former clerk of Judge Kay's. Um, and the indomitable Judge Richard Wesley, <laughs> the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and formerly a judge on the New York Court of Appeals. We couldn't assemble, assemble a better group of people to reflect on the work of Judge Kay. And so we're going to do this by um, each panelist speaking for up to eight minutes. I believe they've been threatened that the dean is ruthless about time <laughs> limits. Um, it's actually that my bark is bigger than my bite on that front, but we will endeavor to stay within that, that parameter. And then at the end of each speaking for, for about that amount of time, I'll pose a question or two uh, to the entire, hopefully to the entire panel that we can take up. If time permits, we'll take questions from the audience, but uh, we'll see how that goes because and in fact, there's so much that one could talk about in Judge Kay's career, we could just commit to stay here for the rest of the semester, um, but, but we'll be mindful of the hour and see how, see how that goes. Um, so, Helene, why don't you kick us off? There's a surprise, Helene, you didn't yes. know that, did you? No, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dean. 
Chief Judge Judith Kay and I were lifelong friends. We attended Barnard College and NYU Law School together, although she was two grades ahead of me. I recall with great pride when she was Chief Judge, she gave the keynote address at my retirement party from the Legal Aid Society and gave special remarks which were quoted in the press release announcing my appointment as president of the Legal Services Corporation. And I remember with a smile when she would have dinner at my home, she would have a lively, fun-like, competitive interaction with my husband as to their addiction to family photo albums. <laughs> Judith was brilliant, compassionate, a doer, and had an amazing work ethic. She was a fr cherished friend to me as she was to so many and left an enduring legacy. I am so pleased to be part of this evening's tribute to her extraordinary judicial legacy. Some of the panelists undoubtedly will focus on her judicial opinions, but when she became chief judge, she had to take on effectively a second full-time job. Not only was she the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, but she was the chief judge of the state of New York, and in that capacity, she was the CEO of a massive court system. Throughout her career as chief, she sought to innovate and improve all areas of court administration and became a national leader in many areas of court and justice reforms. I would like to touch briefly upon two areas where her innovation resulted in making a real difference in the lives of low-income New Yorkers. First was her creation of problem-solving courts. She began with the Midtown Community Court, which opened in 1993, the year she became chief judge. It was the nation's first community court. It was located near Times Square in Manhattan, a neighborhood renowned for pervasive quality of life offenses. It was the first effort to take a different perspective on the swelling misdemeanor docket and address low-level misdemeanor crimes by combining punishment with help. Defendants were sentenced to pay back to their community through visible community service projects. They also were mandated to receive on-site essential services, such as drug treatment, job training, and counseling. The goal was to make justice more responsive to neighborhood concerns and halt the revolving door justice, giving defendants the structure and support they needed to get their lives on track. As a result of the court's emphasis on prompt sentencing and rigorous monitoring, compliance with court orders exceeded the rate typically achieved by criminal court. The impact of the court was felt on the streets of Midtown Manhattan. Each year, the court contributed to the neighborhood when sentenced offenders painted over graffiti, swept the streets, cleaned local parks and subway stations. Independent evaluators documented that the Midtown Community Court approach to justice had not only reduced local crime, but people's lives were genuinely being changed by a positive, constructive court intervention. Chief Judge Kay was so proud of this initiative. I remember when the ABA had its annual meeting in New York in 1993. We took the leadership to, of the ABA on a tour of the Midtown Community Court, and it celebrated its 20th anniversary in 2013. With its emphasis on alternatives to jail for misdemeanor defendants, it has been credited with helping to improve public safety and reduce the use of incarceration and forge better outcomes for offenders, victims, and communities. The Midtown Community Court was so influential that it was replicated around the state, in dozens of cities across the country, and in more than 60 locations worldwide, including England, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and Canada. The Conference of Chief Judges and the Conference of State Court Administrators adopted a joint resolution endorsing the concept of problem-solving courts. The ABA adopted a similar resolution. <coughs> Chief Judge Kay redefined the traditional role of the judiciary in addressing difficult social problems, bringing the courts closer to the communities they serve, and making them more relevant to the problems affecting the lives of ordinary people. Other problem courts followed with the Red Hook Community Justice Center, and some of the principles of the community courts have been adapted in a variety of problem-solving courts, such as drug courts that aim to break the cycle of addiction, crime, and jail, and domestic violence areas that focus on strengthening victim offenders and offender accountability. The second area of her contribution I would like to focus on 
is her Access to Justice initiatives. Chief Judge Kay stated, quote, access to the legal system is an inherent right of citizenship, yet far too many New Yorkers are currently denied this right because they lack economic resources. For thousands of New Yorkers, civil legal services represents the most important contact they will ever have with our justice system and can mean the difference between having a roof over your head or being homeless, between going hungry or receiving food stamps, between children languishing in foster care or being returned to their parents. She further said, quote, for a family seeking protection from eviction or an elderly person confused by the social services bureaucracy or for a battered woman fleeing domestic violence, having access to adequate legal services can be critical to their safety and well-being. Yet only a small percentage of impoverished New Yorkers stand a reasonable chance of getting a lawyer when they desperately need one. End of quote. In 1999, she created the position of Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for Justice Initiatives to address the concerns of low-income individuals' <coughs> inability to have counsel. By creating this position, she brought the subject of access to justice from the margins of court operations to the center of the table. This was the nation's first high-ranking judicial office with the sole mandate <coughs> of eliminating disparities in accessing justice. She appointed Judge Juanita Bing Newton to head that effort. She set as one of the court system's highest priorities to ensure low-income New Yorkers have equal access to the courts and the legal system. Some of the accomplishments of that office included increasing the provision of pro bono services. CLE credit was provided for providing pro bono. In addition, the office focused on enhanced services for unrepresented <coughs> litigants. Resource centers dedicated to helping unrepresented litigants were set up in courthouses throughout the state to provide direct assistance from court-based staff. The responsibilities of this position were assigned to Judge Byrne Fisher in 2009, who today is the director of the New York State Court's Access to Justice Program with statewide responsibility for trying to help ensure equal access to justice. <coughs> Chief Judge Kay was a leader in the country in terms of recognizing the court's role is broader than just making decisions. She embraced new ideas with great enthusiasm and determination. Collaboration and innovation were key elements to her achieving these initiatives. She accomplished these refer reforms with great intelligence, superb interpersonal skills, grace, and elegance. Her persistence in delivering justice in ways that are relevant to the needs of the litigants and the communities in which we all live will be a significant part of her lasting legacy, as will her access to justice legacy with her vision and commitment to ensuring equal access to justice for all, regardless of financial means. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. I have the feeling I may upset whatever expected apple cart we had of order of speakers, but um, yep. Judge, why don't you no. go next? Okay. Actually, <laughs> actually works out well because Elaine and I have kind of collaborated a little bit on this little uh, upstate downstate coalition. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, just a, a personal observation or two before I, I read to you what I uh, intend to read to you. Um, it's hard to know a person the way that colleagues know each other on the New York Court of Appeals or, or clerks get to know the court family by working at the Court of Appeals and kind of separate the person from the judge. And, and, and having spent six and a half years, almost seven years with Judith at the New York Court of Appeals, but knowing her for a period of time before that, you knew that she was an extraordinary person, but you, you were always just kind of so enjoyed knowing her. Hmm. And so, um, I, listening to Lane, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how she empowered people, um, it strikes me that I always thought Judith was special, but I never appreciated how special she was until we lost, we lost her. Hmm. And, and so you started to take stock of what, what it was that she had done. You know, because she was, she was a whirling dervish. She was just constant energy. 
Uh, what I want to read to you is that in 2007, when Judith was up for reappointment um, for, for her second term as chief judge, um, she asked if I would deliver a, 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 a talk to the Senate Committee on Judiciary and the State Senate to Chairman DeFrancisco and the, and the, the Judiciary Committee. Um, this is Judith Kay, the ultimate uh, politician. She knew if she brought this upstate Republican into a bunch of Republican senators <laughs> that she had a chance of surviving. Um, so, so Judith was also a keen political intellect. And I want to read to you just a portion of what I said to the Senate that day because it encapsulates uh, what I want to convey and kind of build off of what Helene talked about. So I'm actually reading to you the, the actual text of what I, I gave on, to the Senate Judiciary Committee there in June of 2007. I think it appropriate to begin with how I first met Judith K. Ford. Is a great, it says a great deal about her. In, spring, in the spring of 1993, I was the supervising judge for the criminal courts of the 7th Judicial District, an eight-county area in the Finger Lakes region that includes Monroe County. We were experiencing monumental backlogs in criminal cases in Monroe County. That's where Rochester, New York is located. And I assembled a committee of judges, prosecutors, defense counsel, and court staff to address the problem. The solution, felony screening, presented a new way of handling felony cases without compromising public safety or the rights of the accused. The process allows prosecutors and defense counsel to quickly identify cases that might be resolved by a plea before they are waived on to the grand jury. <clears throat> We began our trial run of the procedure in early April of 1993. One day as I was conducting court, taking pleas and setting up conference dates, we had a visitor. In walked the recently confirmed <coughs> Judith, Chief Judge Judith Kay. Of course, everything stopped. The Chief, with her pleasant smile, said good morning to all and asked us to proceed with our business. After court, Judge Kay came back to my chambers as some of you may know, Judith's undergraduate training was in journalism. She has never lost or, or had never lost the inquisitiveness or the steady barrage of careful questions that those in the press practice. She had lots of questions and was most attentive to my answers. She encouraged me to keep careful track of the results of our efforts and to make sure we got them out to judges, legislators, and other policymakers so that they might benefit from our successes and failures. Thereafter, she regularly corresponded with me monthly, always asking about the program and its progress. Felony screening remains today, today, and I'm now speaking in the present in 2016, a vital fixture of the criminal justice process in Monroe County when Sarah Wesley first started as a Monroe County Assistant District Attorney. She was in the felony screening part for her first few weeks. She didn't know her father had created it <laughs> and has been adopted yeah. elsewhere, I might add, statewide. <clears throat> Now, my experience with Judith Kay and felony screening parallels that of many other hardworking and committed judges across the state. No other judge has provided over such a time of dynamic change in our courts, in how our courts operate and deliver justice to New Yorkers than Judith Kay. Chief Judge Kay has created an environment where judges, lawyers, court staff, and laypersons have been empowered to look at our courts and ask, quote, can't we do it better? She was always asking, can't we do it better? The resounding answer has been yes. The brilliance of Judith Kay's leadership is in her unbridled faith that people of goodwill can come together and find common ground to produce a new solution to long-standing problems. The list of careful, of careful reforms that she has nurtured is too long to recite in full here today. Drug courts, you know, to this day, we still even have a drug court in Livingston County. Who would have thought we'd have one in Livingston County of all places? The domestic violence part where one judge hears all aspects of a domestic dispute, community courts, mental health courts, jury reform. As I said, the list goes on and on. No one in this great state of ours has done more to ensure that the courts of New York are open for the people's business and that all who come will have their grievances heard be it a sophisticated multinational corporation involved in a contract dispute in the commercial part or a desperate mother looking for child support. The chief judge's focused devotion to leaving our court system better and when she took its helm will be a lasting testament to her vision, her energy, her sense of purpose. You know, um, 
I only want to re-emphasize two, two aspects of that, her vision and her energy. I don't know of anyone in my adult life, I'm now 67 years old, I have never met anyone with the type of energy that Judith Kay had. Judith Kay knew the birthday of every single person at the New York Court of Appeals. <laughs> Judith Kay would be on top of every single writing that was going on in the court, and I, have, I still have to this day the Kay edits in Hamilton versus Beretta, the opinion I wrote about handgun manufacturers' liability for downstream illegal purchases. And Judith Kay was originally not of a mind to join me in that opinion. I went through 17 edits with Judith Kay. <laughs> and finally on the 17th edit, I got it right and I got her vote. But, and at the same time, this is a woman who was in, in going around the state and figuring out ways to create new courts. So she was completely on top of the work of the court. She was completely on top of re reshaping the way we deliver justice in New York. And at the same time, if someone at the New York Court of Appeals was sick, she would bundle a few of us up and take us up to the hospital to make sure that we saw him. And by the way, she always led the book of the month club at the New York Court of Appeals. I didn't, I didn't have time to read the damn book. I just went there and listened to Judith tell me about the book. So I want to close. Uh, it, it, it's incredible to me, looking back at it now, on, on what she did and what she accomplished. And yet, at the same time, she left her mark on a number of other things that Lisa and Steve and, and, and Al are going to talk about. But let me leave and close with something that appears in the New York, the NYU Law Review. In 2009, I was asked to also represent the judges of the court for an event at the um, City Bar, the Association of the City Bar. And it was an occasion to remember Judith uh, and her, the, the uh, coming to the end of her chief judgeship. So I was asked to speak uh, for the judges there. And let me close with the two paragraphs. And this, uh, this is at volume 84, page uh, 680 for my law review friends, so I know are going to be very careful about citations. Uh, <coughs> and it's well edited, I might add, by the NYU yeah, Law Review. Let me close with a few final thoughts. I harbor no foolish hope that what I write here has conveyed all that is Judith Kay. The woman is just too complex, dynamic, and exquisitely unique to portray her, portray her fairly in just a few paragraphs. But this much I do know. Judith Kay has reshaped the courts of New York with her bold vision of a better way to deliver justice, and she has left her own indelible stamp on his jurisprudence and on those who were privileged to serve with her. How can someone who is so busy always manage to find time to be such a good <coughs> and loving friend? In June of 2003, when I said goodbye, to my colleagues and friends at the New York Court of Appeals, I said of my dear friend, is there another human being on this earth with more energy and enthusiasm for just causes, with a kinder heart, a nobler view of what we do? I think not. When the book is closed, the portrait hung, the tally made, Kay will stand with the great judges of all time. In this cynical age in which we live, it is refreshing to see someone who is the real deal, a person whose compassion and commitment are genuine. It was a great honor for me to serve with her on the New York Court of Appeals, and I must tell you, it truly changed my life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Judge Rosenblatt, why don't we go to you? Uh, yes, Dean, it, it's, so, it's so thoughtful of you to assemble uh, a group of people up here <clears throat> not to mention those out there who uh, who see different sides of, of Judge Kay. And Helene spoke about <clears throat> the heart that Judge Kay brought to <clears throat> the expansion of the courts and her concern for people who were most needful of access to the courts. And Judge Wesley, her talents as an administrator and all the great things that she did <clears throat> outside of the 43 New York 2nd or 22 New York 3rd, those writings that endure forever. <clears throat> so we've heard two sides, both of which include also, of course, the human side, to which I might add that, uh, now, Dean, I, I, I hope that as I approach eight minutes, you'll start coughing. <clears throat> uh, we thought about at one time when the lawyers are at the podium and, the, and it says 10 minutes time uh, for their oral argument, that we might enforce the rule by having a trap door, but, <laughs> but Judith wouldn't, wouldn't hear of it. <clears throat> uh, 
Judith's, Judith's humanism, uh, I think, became apparent to me early when we would have breakfast together because being on the court, it was quite, it was monastic and quite intimate. So I'd have breakfast with her often and with Judge Wesley. And one thing that I learned about her early on that remained with me forever and taught me a lot, and that was that <clears throat> we're sitting there having our oatmeal and there'd be a stream of people that would come in, a maintenance people. And the maintenance people would come in, the women, and they would, they would give her muffins and flowers and hugs. And this is like a CEO embracing the people who are, and she's at one end, and the other folks are at the other end, but you wouldn't know it because she treated pretty much everyone the same. She would treat them the way she would treat uh, high, high officials. And at that time, we were getting out of the courthouse, so um, the folks, the maintenance guys, would find things in the attic, and they, she would call them her curators because they would find documents that were 100 or 150 years old, and we'd talk about them. <clears throat> Um, I, so I'm going to talk about a slightly different side, although I certainly value and enjoy immensely listening to uh, the other s sides of her well-rounded persona, and that is around the table and how she um, emphasized that we live in a nation in which there's not one constitution in each state but two. And she was, I think, one of the um, most alert and most progressive jurists who advanced the notion of state constitutionalism. Uh, this began <clears throat> likely with an article by Justice Brennan, after whom the Brennan Center is made, when he recognized <clears throat> that an era had ended and a new era was beginning from the Warren Court to the Rehnquist Court. <clears throat> and he alerted the bench and bar to the existence of state constitutions. Most people out there when you speak about constitutional rights, they would think about the United States Constitution, of course, as having primacy. But beginning in the late 1970s, <clears throat> when some of the constitutional interpretations uh, were seen as a bit, um, a bit harsher than they were in the, uh, in, under the Warren Court. Is that a good word, harsher? Would, would, you, would, that, would that pass muster, you think? <clears throat> um, in any case, it was Justice Brennan in one arm and Judge Kaye in the other, who shined the spotlight on the existence of state constitutions in which there could be primacy in civil rights and civil liberties by having recourse to the state constitution. Most people do not realize it, most Americans do not realize it, and I think most lawyers do not even recognize that state constitutional rights have primacy over United States Supreme Court interpretation of the same Rights, so that while no state may fall below a certain federal floor, state courts employing state constitutions may accord greater liberties to the citizens in state trials. Uh, this was known to me a little bit, but I really didn't become a student of it until under the tutorship of Judge Kay, who wrote articles on it and who certainly uh, introduced us to it around the table as she was fervent in that regard. And I might say that at this hour, when we do not know what the jurisprudential future is going to hold for us and what the constitutional future is going to hold for us, if the late 1970s were one era of state constitutional renaissance, I am prepared to say that it's quite possible that this is the beginning, possibly, of a new era of state constitutional renaissance. <clears throat> Uh, in which the writings of Judith Kay will not be seen necessarily as gems of the past, but as vehicles of the future. And when you look down the, uh, what we call the Bill of Rights, the Ten Amendments, there are not 10 rights in those uh, provisions. Actually, there are about 25, because the First Amendment has not one right, but religion, uh, free exercise, establishment, petition, assembly, freedom of press, and each of them have a number of rights in it. There are maybe 25 in all. And it was Judith Kay who in her articles and in her insistence around the table that we not ignore the state constitutions that really highlighted and sensitized us uh, to those rights. Here's what she said in an article that she wrote for a law review about constitutionalism. The day-to-day -day function of a constitution is a fact of human nature 
and of the democratic process, that our actions, both as individuals and as a community, sometimes conflict with our most basic values. When we set out to embody in our constitutions are those values which we never want to sacrifice to more transient choices, however compelling they might seem at the present moment. And so we saw this unfold when we were sitting around the table and in a number of decisions uh, that she wrote where she um, not only emphasized but really led the charge towards state constitutionalism, particularly with the right to counsel, which was one of her um, cherished state constitutional rights, and uh, recognizing also that state constitutionalism advanced not only in the Bill of Rights, <clears throat> but in other state constitutional precepts, such as uh, education, CFE, need we remind you of that, uh, Forever Wild, and, uh, and ed education, and, uh, and the poor. These are provisions that exist in state constitutions that do not exist in the United States Constitution, which, as we all know, the justices of the United States Supreme Court have termed the United States Constitution a negative document. Not that it's a bad document, but in the sense that it says the Congress may not do this, and this may not happen, and this may not happen, but the state constitution creates rights under Article 16 and 17 for the poor and for education and for other important social and cultural interests. And I think in the future, we're going to see Judge Kaye's writings cited not only in the commercial arena, not only in other forms of in the jurisprudential arena, but in what I would imagine to be uh, yet another renaissance of state uh, cons constitutionalism. So I'll, I'll conclude with that <coughs> recognition and that uh, just as an with an illustration or two that these were not idle abstract thoughts on her part when she did extol the state constitution. Um, it was in Laval, People Against Laval, that the New York Court of Appeals, in which she, although she didn't write the decision, she was a moving force around the table, uh, struck down the death penalty in New York, not on constitutional grounds of the United States Constitution. That death penalty fell owing to an interpretation of due process under the New York State Constitution. It may well be that the Laval case could have survived federal constitutional due process Fifth Amendment challenge, but it did not survive New York Fifth Amendment, New York due process challenge when we concluded that the deadlock instruction was not tolerable under New, under New York's version of, uh, the, of due process. So <clears throat> we're going to remember all those, and I think that at this particular hour, given that we are in a position in our constitutional history where we are not able to look into the future, I'm going to guess that we're going to remember Judith Kay not only as the marvelous person that she was with her personal qualities, her beloved qualities, that we, were, we would embrace her and think of her as being not only scholarly and uh, thoughtful but could be howlingly funny, uh, but as a constitutional scholar whose writings will shine on not only the past, but I think on the future. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stephen. Thanks, Dean. Uh, for me and my fellow K clerks, um, Judge K was simply referred to as the judge. There was and will always be just one in our hearts. It's truly a privilege to have a chance to honor her legal legacy here tonight who, for a person who had such a profound impact on so many people, including myself. As I was trying to decide what to speak about tonight, um, I came to a quick realization that I had neither the expertise, I've just been out of the New York law scene for so long, um, as well as the smarts, as my clients tell me when I can't, when I uh, tell them they can't do something, to have any kind of penetrating analysis into the judge's jurisprudence in any particular area. Uh, but what I can offer is something smaller but more personal. Um, something f just focusing on my experience working with the judge um, as her law clerk from 1996 to 1998. I want to focus just in the interest of time on two particular cases, Matter of Johnson v. Pataki and Cass v. Cass. <laughs> judge Wesley is familiar with the, uh, the first one very well. <laughs> um, anybody who's familiar with these cases might ask, like, how did he get to work with the judge on these cases? 
well, it definitely the test wasn't who was the best lawyer in chambers, believe me, thank God. It was, what happened was that the judge uh, would allow uh, the three clerks to decide whenever a case, when the cases came up for session, uh, to divvy up the cases among themselves, which I thought was great. And by tradition, the, when I was around, the senior clerk would, of course, get first dibs on the cases. So when these cases came up uh, during the session, uh, I'm not stupid, I, had the, uh, I jumped at the opportunity to work on these cases with the judge, one involving the, the, the governor's executive power and reach in the context of New York's death, temp death penalty statute, and the other involving a divorce dispute um, over frozen embryos. So let me focus on Johnson v. Pataki. I think the political and legal, the political and legal landscape is pretty important. Um, in 1995, 18 years after uh, the Court of Appeals and People v. Davis struck down New York's death penalty statute, um, then newly elected Governor Pataki uh, signed into law a new death penalty statute. Uh, almost immediately, some DAs expressed reservations about seeking capital punishment. Uh, one district attorney, then District Attorney Robert Johnson in the Bronx, uh, made some statements that, um, that the governor, including the governor, believed was an indication that he was going to adopt a blanket policy against imposition of the death penalty. Uh, starting in late 1995, the governor, joined with other politicians in New York newspapers, then began publicly criticizing the court. Um, they criticized the court and decisions for supposedly being pro-criminal. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat the criticism. For example, the governor blasted the court for creating irrational, mindless procedural safeguards for criminals. One paper denounced the court as a friend to the felon. Yikes. <laughs> Let me just talk about the case. In March 14, 1996, New York City police officer Kevin Gillespie uh, was murdered in a shootout in the Bronx. Uh, the governor, as he had done once before, uh, wrote to the Bronx DA and said, are there any circumstances under which you will impose the death penalty in Bronx County? Uh, the Bronx DA responded that his original statement left the door ajar, quote unquote, however slight, to exercise the option in the Bronx. The next day, the governor, based on his stated concern that the Bronx DA's blanket policy against the death penalty would put in jeopardy other death sentences in other counties based on excessive punishment and disproportionality, issued an executive order pursuant to the New York Constitution and the executive law directing the attorney general to take over the investigation of the case from the Bronx DA. Subsequently, one of the defendants was indicted for first degree murder, and the Attorney General then filed notice that he was going to seek, that the people were going to seek the death penalty. The Bronx DA and the residents of Bronx County then challenged the superseder, what, was, what it was called, the replacement of him. And um, he, was, his, he was, the governor's action was affirmed by the Supreme Court and the First Department. To further complicate matters, the defendant in this case actually committed suicide in jail during the pendency of the appeals. Against this backdrop, the Court of Appeals ruled 4-3 uh, with Judge Wesley in the majority with Judge Kay, with an opinion written by Judge Kay that upheld the governor's action. The majority held that the executive order was lawful on, on its face and therefore immune from judicial review, but even if judicial review was appropriate, the governor's action was, was rational, and there was a rational basis, and was lawful as well. Judge Tatone dissented, saying that the unusual circumstances warranted judicial review of the governor's action, and that the governor's action was constituted executive overreach. Judge Smith dissented, joined by Judge Saparic, on grounds that the action was moot, and in any event, lacked a rational basis. Despite all this Monday morning quarterbacking and attempts to deduce all these le non-legal reasons why the judge may have voted as she did, some surmise she voted with the so-called conservative bloc to alleviate any criticism of the court, not once during the time we worked together did I ever get a sense that this was happening. Let's be real, we all know the judge was politically astute and politically wears anybody. But these theories were kind of ridiculous because they overlooked her strength of conviction and her respect for the law that she had demonstrated for decades. Here, as always, she relied on one of her core judicial principles that she instilled in all her clerks, doing what's right. It's not legal, it's not a results-oriented doing what's right. It's letting the law and the facts, not personal and policy predilections, uh, guide your decision. You know, as was the norm during preparations for oral argument, um, 
The judge and I debated back and forth all the legal arguments, but, and usually in a lot of cases, you would get a sense where the judge was going before she was uh, going to vote. But in this case, I had no idea. This was one of the rare cases where she went into conference that morning. I didn't have any idea where she was going to go with this case. Uh, but in my humble personal opinion, um, she was right, not because it was the politically expedient thing to do, because it was, but it was because it was the right thing to do. I also want to make a comment about the judge's writing style. Um, last week, when I finally settled on a topic, I read over this opinion for the first time in 15 years. And man, no one could write like her. And I think all law school students and uh, young lawyers could really you know, do themselves a the world of good by, by reading the judge's writings. Um, she always told us about the necessity for the court's opinions to be understandable and accessible, not just to lawyers, but to laypersons whose decisions they were directly affecting. But when you think about the majority's position, her opinion is user-friendly in so many ways. There are no wasted words. The holding is stated very clearly up front in the first paragraph, so you don't have to engage in a treasure hunt to try to find out what the court held. She re she, the rationale of the dissents she takes on head-on so people can make their own decisions about you know, the merits of the arguments. And also, she kind of goes right to the, to the issue. She cuts through. All of, the, all of the facts and complexity, and really she gets to the heart of the issue. And really, two well-crafted sentences from the judge neatly sum up the majority's position. The superseder statute neither limits the governor's authority to supersede nor requires the governor to explain that choice. And two, whether or not district attorneys must exercise their death penalty discretion on a case-by-case -case basis, clearly the legislature did not allow one or all 62 district attorneys to functionally veto the statute by adopting a blanket policy, thereby in effect refusing to exercise discretion. Finally, let's discuss the fact that during the time I was there, a 4-3 split was very rare. And I agree with those who have written about the judge's um, desire to try to achieve unanimity uh, when at all possible. Um, however, on this case, uh, from talking to others, other clerks in the weeks before the case, all of us knew this was not going to be a 7-0 decision. And I think if we knew, the judges knew themselves. You know, after the judges had staked out their respective positions and there were memos going back and forth and drafts going back and forth, which is typical, you know, I can recall just thinking back that um, some of the initial writings were, I mean, to be blunt, um, they, were, they were harsh, uh, they were bitter, and they were emotional. And the judge is a realist. She realized that this was the kind of case, you know, legally and, and especially factually, where people are going to have strong differences of opinion. Yet, given her love and respect for the court as an institution, and she was the caretaker of its storied legacy, she couldn't let things get out of hand. She couldn't let it escalate to a point of no return. So behind the scenes, the judge did what we all expected her to do, through measured, well-reasoned opinions, and through candid conversations with all of her beloved colleagues, she really got everybody back together. To, he brought everyone back to civil and collegial discourse. You know, what resulted was something I think was pretty remarkable. Three very divergent opinions, but all elegant in their own way. I also want to deal with Cass v. Cass. This was a case of first impression. It involved a divorce dispute over the disposition of frozen and stored pre-embryos or pre-zygotes uh, created during marriage through IVF. <laughs> After divorce, Maureen Cass wanted so Wesley is having flashbacks. Right <laughs> <laughs> yes, look at this. <laughs> talk more about this, can't <laughs> After divorce, Maureen Cass wanted the pre-zygotes implanted. She said this was a last chance for genetic motherhood. Uh, Stephen Cass uh, objected to this, saying that he it was, you know, fatherhood was against his wishes. And it was his position that the written consent forms that the parties had signed uh, previously actually dictated that the pre-zygote should be donated to the IVF program for research. You know, uh, the implications of the case were momentous on so many levels. You had the role of cutting edge science at the time. Uh, here's Judge Kay's uh, line, as science races ahead, it leaves in its trail mind-numbing ethical and legal questions. There also whether confl conflicting interests of wife and husband should be subject to a balancing test, and if so, should one party's interests be weighed more heavily than the other? And three, whether prezygotes were persons who should be constitutionally protected, or should they, as the one, as the Tennessee Supreme Court 
uh, had ruled, the only other court at that time that had ruled on something similar, were that the prezygotes were entitled to special respect because of their potential for human life. To add to this perfect storm of complexity, you had a lack of consensus down below. You have the Supreme Court granted custody of the prezygotes to Maureen Cass. What they ruled was that the female participant in an IVF procedure had exclusive decisional authority over the fertilized eggs created during the process. The second department reversed and ruled for Stephen Cass, but there were two dissents. There was a two-judge plurality and a separate concurring opinion. So the judge wrote the unanimous opinion for the court, uh, affirmed the appellate division decision, and ruled in favor of Stephen Cass. You know, as she would do time and time again, what we would do is we'd just be, you know, briefing her or prepping her, and we'd just go into, the, go into so many tangents. We'd talk about all these non-salient facts. We'd, we'd just recite every single argument that was made in the briefs, and the judge would just interrupt us. You go, what's the issue here? I, I just, it just, you know, I'm getting flashbacks and very good flashbacks because it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's just so key. You know, cut through the noise, cut through the red herrings, cut through all this collateral stuff and just get to the heart of the matter. And really what the heart of the matter is what she said, quote unquote, the central issue is whether the written consents clearly express the party's intent regarding disposition of the prezygotes in the present circumstances. Two, what emerges most strikingly from these consents as a whole is that the appellant and respondent intended that the disposition of the prezygotes was to be their joint decision. Three, thus only by joint decisions of the parties would the prezygotes be used for implantation and otherwise by mutual consent they would be donated to the IVF program for research purposes. I have some vivid recollections about the challenges as, we, as, we were, as the judge was drafting the, uh, this opinion. Um, First, I remember that none of us in chambers, I don't think anybody in the court really had any experience or expertise in any of the scientific or ethical subjects that were being presented. Um, you know, in the end, although the court relied on a contract theory, uh, the court understood fully well the social ramifications of the decision and the need to make sure, if not expressly addressed in the opinion, at least that the important contextual elements were being addressed behind the scenes. This is one of the few cases that I worked on where amicus briefs and secondary source materials were really important. I just remember there were law review articles strewn all over my office. If anybody has been in the judge's chamber, she has that table, by, she had that table by the library. There was tons of bioethics journals all over the place. And I remember us just debating and reading through these journals and just going back and forth, just trying to make sure we didn't miss anything on that end. You know, second, there was also some downsides to relying on a contract interpretation in this type of case. Um, I remember very clearly Judge, as she was drafting the opinion, uh, she, had, she was concerned and she had sensitivity to the impression that the court was being callous by seemingly treating prezygotes as property whose future was controlled by dry language on a piece of paper. Um, in the end, the judge skillfully addressed that concern by emphasizing that consents were much more than an emotionless document. They were expressions of the intent and desires of two well-meaning people who at one time wanted to create a human life together. Third, the judge always had an uncanny ability to be the closer. And what I call is just, she can really turn a simple phrase that just summed up the facts and law and, and the broader implications in one fell swoop. I remember trying to take a stab at drafting um, a sentence in, in Cass um, it was an important point she was trying to make, and she, she saw I was struggling. So she just walked into my office. She took the, the page from the draft I was, I was working on, went back to her office, came back a few minutes later, and she handed me the page. It was her handwritten edits were on the page. And she stood in my doorway in my office, and Kay Clips and all that. She would she just stand there, and she said, well, Steve, what do you think? And, you know, I read it, and, you know, I said openly, I said, this is perfect. But, you know, she didn't hear what I was really thinking is that, you know, I will never be this good, ever. <laughs> and, you know, here's her line. She, she, you know, she says, I mean, it's short, and she says, to the extent possible, it should be the progenitors, not the state and the courts, who by their prior directive make this deeply personal life choice. You know, wow. You know, another takeaway from, K, from the Cass opinion is that it expresses the judge's view that one of the purposes of law is to provide predictability and certainty in a timely fashion, whether in business or personal matters, so that people can plan, they can take action, and move forward accordingly. 
you know, first to just address timeliness, the Cass opinion was published 37 days after oral argument, which is pretty remarkable. And, uh, but this was par for the course for the judge. The judge always insisted and she realized the importance of the court delivering timely, definitive guidance quickly so people could act, so people could move, not hold people. We didn't have the luxury of five or six months to do a decision. She realized it wasn't a luxury thing for the court. If people were depending on the court to deliver guidance, and that's what she did. You know, second, by focusing on a, on a contractual rationale, she, she really reflected the judge's belief that there was, there's often no greater source of predictability and certainty in law than the parties themselves deciding what to do on their own and without leaving in the hands of others like judges for them. You know, the evidence is in this following quote from Cass. Indeed, parties should be encouraged in advance before embarking on IVF and cryopreservation to think through possible contingencies and express their wishes in writing. Explicit agreements avoid costly litigation and business transactions. They're all the more necessary and desirable in personal matters of reproductive choice, where the intangible costs of any litigation are simply incalculable. Advanced directives subject to mutual change of mind that must be jointly expressed both minimize misunderstandings and maximize procreative liberty by reserving to the progenitors the authority to make what is in the first instance a quintessentially personal and, and private decision. Yeah, and just a final recollection from Cass. Uh, we didn't know it, but the judge, after she, she wrote the opinion and it was published, she, she got a lot of letters, uh, praise, a lot of letters of praise from law, from a wide variety of people, law professors, bioethicists, legislatures, even members of the public. And one day I got into chambers, and of course the judge was in her office, and it's a common thing, you know, having worked out probably for two hours, she had breakfast and lunch, written 20 letters, made 40 phone calls, and drafted a law review article. <laughs> you know, I got to my desk and, and there quiet were- Quiet day. <laughs> <laughs> And I got to my desk, and there were, there were a pile of letters clipped together, and they were just sitting uh, right in front of my terminal. You know, and the judge was tough, and you know, I didn't expect to run in my office, you know, give me a hug, Steve, go, oh, great job. You know, it was, you know, we didn't have that kind of relationship. But it was, but it was that, that quiet gesture of kindness, uh, appreciation, and respect, and you know, that's what the judge you know, was all about. Hmm. And just to sum up, I think if Cass and John C. B. Pataki demonstrated anything, it's tough to uh, make any sweeping generalizations about the judge's jurisprudence. She was just too strong, she was just too smart, and she was too complex to be a label, unless that label's the judge, the one and only to many of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, you're bad in cleanup. I know, it's, it's uh, always difficult to, to add to such an esteemed panel um, and people who've known the judge so well. And uh, Steve and I were laughing, you, you hear the themes of the judge being so thoughtful and careful. Um, and as I was preparing what to say, I heard the judge's voice in my head, which I often do, saying, the enemy of the perfect is the good. Uh, so, excuse me, the enemy of the good is the perfect. But her second line, which many people know was, well, we still want to be perfect, right? You know? <laughs> so um, it will not be perfect, as Stephen said. We, we often looked and said, I, I will, as good as I will ever be, I will not be you. But um, I want to talk about Judge Kay's legacy not as a thing of the past, um, but as something that she has left with all of us. And I hope that um, it, it goes well beyond her for generations to come. Um, as Dean Marson said, I was a um, clerk for Judge Kay, and I, I remember I was telling Louisa before, is that the first time that I walked into her chambers, for anyone who hasn't been there, there's a front room, and there's a, a pillar of a wall right there, and on the, the wall is a framed picture of a child's artwork um, from class. I learned it was a, a five-year-old's artwork, and indeed her uh, granddaughter's artwork. And it says, a little picture of, a stick figure judge, of course, um, that says, um, when I grew up, I want to be a chief judge. <laughs> and there's a second sentence and longer explanation why, because of course Judge Kay taught her to make pointed arguments, uh, even though she was a five-year-old at the time. Um, and if you know Judge Kay, you would know how much her family meant to her. Um, and I think second to nothing in the world, that the, the, her family, her children, her grandchildren were always the, such a great source of pleasure to her. 
Um, but the story isn't just about her family, and it's not just how she respected and loved her children or her grandchildren, um, or the impact she had on teaching one or two people around her um, what you could do with your life. Um, it's also not just an example of her role as a trailblazer woman judge. Um, I think that her legacy is her um, decision to be such an accomplished jurist and to impact so many of us in so many ways, not just a five-year-old girl, um, but what she has left in her mission to leave a little piece of her with all of us. Um, she had such a unique ability to, to be such an accomplished jurist. There's no end, as Dean Norris said, we could spend all night talking about it, all week talking about it. Um, but she also, as you heard tonight, really remembered that the law of New York is the law of its citizens. And she had the power not merely to make law, but to shape individual lives, both through the substantive court rulings that she was overseeing and working on, but by considering how the court system and the decisions that the court was making really affected the day-to-day -day lives of the ordinary people um, and the people who live in the state. Um, I mean, when I think of the ways to, to talk about the substance, I do encourage you, like everyone has, to just read, 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 because she was a prolific writer, read her essays, read her decisions. Um, they could fill bookshelves and rooms, and she was a, a paper person, so they definitely would fill bookshelves and rooms and not just virtual libraries, um, along with all the personal notes and everything she's left for us with all her tokens of wisdom. Um, but as much as she was a forward thinker, she, she was such a forward thinker in so many areas of the law, you've heard it tonight, um, in family rights and education and criminal justice and well, same-sex marriage, there's just an endless list of big uh, headline issues that she really changed the law in. Um, you heard about her uh, prolific writing from other people, um, and she just loved the exercise of being a writer. The editor never left her. But uh, as Stephen was saying, that it wasn't just the um, headline-grabbing issues that got her attention. She really devoted equal talent and energy and commitment to all the issues that came before the court. And she really understood that the, um, there was great importance of the court decisions on all the questions, the endless number of questions um, presented on appeal that really touched and affected people's lives and their rights and protections as citizens of the great state of New York in, in just un, endless uh, important ways. Um, issues came before her on obviously criminal justice and search and seizure law family law, but also employment matters, personal and real property issues, banking matters, workers' comp, medical malpractice, consumer fraud, the list goes on. I think it was something I really learned being on the court that as much as everyone looks to the United States Supreme Court, mm -hmm. chances are the things that are um, influencing your life and your privacy and your rights and your, your role as a citizen often really come from the state court, the state laws, and the, uh, the decisions that are coming down from there. Um, each of these matters, whether the biggest headline or the smallest issue, consumed the judge's equal attention. Um, and because she really understood that these important legal questions, regardless of the subject, really would have real world consequences to the people coming before her and the court. Um, and they were important to developing cohesive law and a predictable body of law, but also that the idea of creating law was that so citizens could avoid future litigation, and they could have clear and effective court rulings coming down that told everyone how to proceed and helped us to, to live together as citizens. And Stephen had talked about some of the experiences um, being a Judge K clerk, or a clerk of the judge, with apologies to Judge Rosenblatt and Wesley who were there at the same time. <laughs> okay. There wasn't only one judge, but there was one capital J judge that we always <laughs> referred to. Um, but a common question, when you were talking and debating issues with the judge, that she would ask you that every clerk had to be ready to answer, and certainly people in front of her arguing their position always had to be able to answer, what's the rule of law that you want us to adopt? What's your rule of law? How will this work? Not beyond, not just for you, but what are you asking us to do, and what example are you asking us to set for the people who come and look to the decisions of the future, who want the predictability going forward, and for the people who are charged in the court system and the government and throughout with administering and interpreting and applying the court's rulings in the future. And while 
she certainly was vigilant and laser focused, to use one of her favorite terms, on developing that clear and uh, path and our well articulated rule of law. It was such a predominant force, but it wasn't the only force that was guiding her when she was making these decisions. She also understood, as we've talked about, this more human and practical side of the decisions, and that however monumental a decision would be, and however clearly and articulately written it would be, that the rights and the obligations that are being handed down in that decision really were only valuable and useful if they could be easily exercised by, and, or the court citizens could use these protections in an average way that they could pick up the decisions that it would change their lives, and that they didn't always have access to the Court of Appeals or maybe to any court, um, and that she had to recognize that, and the court needed to recognize that in setting rules of law and in issuing decisions. And so she really looked to that when she was making that decision, and you were also asked as a K clerk um, or as anyone in the court, um, does that make sense when you sit there and tell her your, your grand idea of how the law linked together or your, your decision that you wrote? She's like, I say, well, does that really make sense? And you knew when you got that question there was only really one answer. <laughs> and it wasn't yes very often. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, I think it really, while it was always like, oh, I, uh, I, I'm thinking, we'll go back to our, our computer and work on it some more, it really did force you to go back and think about what you were deciding, what pieces of law you are piecing together, if you stated a rule of law, what that really meant tomorrow, the next day, and for the, the judiciary going forward and for the citizens going forward, that the, the decisions needed to be clear, but they also needed to be able to help people in the world. And I think that you've heard other things that Judge Kay has done in her lifetime. Um, she had a commitment to developing problem-solving courts, to improving judicial pay, and to working on family and children's issues. That really isn't complementary to this judicial uh, law decision-making. It really was part of her inherent fabric of how to look at the law and the role of the court and um, what the, the role of lawyers were to protect um, New York citizens. And I think really most importantly, um, one thing that we haven't probably spent enough time talking about tonight is that Judge Kay also understood that as impressive and tireless as she was, and she really was very impressive and relentlessly tireless at the things that she believed in, but one of her most important contributions was not her ability to just do things on her own, but to be able to enlist others hmm. and to bring other people to be oriented to those very same goals and to teach all the lawyers, a countless number of lawyers who interacted with her, and that she could reach directly or indirectly by working with them, by speaking publicly, by whatever she could do, that th these were important um, principles to uphold and that it was really important to have a, a good legal system and laws that were clear and that ones that made sense in protecting New Yorkers um, and having citizens treated fairly um, in their lives. Um, and in preparing for this panel, of course, I felt I can't just talk without sources and I need to start thinking about what other people have said and try to add something. But I did find a um, NYU Law Magazine article that listed out six life lessons of the chief judge, which was, of course, pithy and wise um, and relying on the shoulders of others as well. Um, it was excerpted from a speech that she gave shortly before she was being reconfirmed on the bench in 2007. And of course, all of them are equally inspiring. Um, but her final life lesson um, from the speech is a perfect one when you talk about her judicial legacy. Um, her lesson number six was taken from the words of the late South African lawyer, soldier, and statesman, General Jan, Jan Christian Smuts. We always have to have proper citation, as Judge Rosenblatt noted. Um, and the lesson was, when enlisted in a good cause, never surrender, for you can never tell what morning reinforcements will come marching over the hilltop. Now, it's a typical Judge K quote. It's anchored in inspiration. It demonstrates both her courage and her willingness to be on the front lines of a cause and her, commission, her commitment to keep pushing forward to resist and counter any obstacles that are putting, put in the way and the path to possible success. But it's also fairly characteristic in that it carries this sense of modesty that doesn't fairly credit Judge K's legacy in working towards these good causes because, in fact, Judge Kay understood that in working to effect change, to fight for good causes, and to carry forward that legacy through her own tireless work, 
She didn't just hope that reinforcements would be behind her, but she actively recruited and inspired other people, armies of lawyers, courtroom personnel, politicians, citizens of the state, to also help her to stand up and to work towards these good causes um, for the protection and the benefit of everyone. And while Judge Kay left behind volumes of judicial opinions, she also has left behind these judicial principles and her commitment at all times to the highest, and moral, highest moral and professional standards and her compassion for a community in which all members of society have a voice and that we're all respected equally under the law. And so she shared these values with her life lessons with her colleagues over the years, as you've heard, with the dozens of judicial clerks who she trained and mentored and supported, and we all walk around with her voice in our heads saying, does that make sense? <laughs> um, my, my poor children, when they hear that, don't like that one either. <laughs> but she also <clears throat> shared her values and her life lessons, her inspiration, her work with the hundreds of thousands of employees of the New York court system that she worked and inspired to keep the doors of justice open and operating every day, and through her writing, her speeches, and every way the list goes on. Um, and I know that while she's not with us anymore physically, that she will never leave any of us who interacted with her um, in the, these efforts that she made on behalf of everyone in the state and in order to create that legacy by herself and to inspire us to push that forward when she can't be there at the top of the hill to lead us over. And I, it's so wonderful to know that a scholarship is being created in her name it's just one of many ways that that will be furthered. Um, and I hope that everyone tonight in hearing um, our experiences with her and hearing about her is inspired to just pick her causes or pick your causes, um, but to, to pick up the tireless energy and to move the law forward and to remind ourselves of the lessons she's taught us. And I think that's really the legacy that I take with her, so. Thank you so much. Thank you to all five panelists. Um, been just terrific remarks. It's brought us uh, roughly to the end of our allocated time, and I hate to be the one to cut off conversation <laughs> with someone about whom could be said um, so much, um, but I want us to be able to enjoy each other's company uh, in the course of the reception that follows as well. I'll, I'll propose then just to close with, with this thought. Uh, uh, some of you may have attended, and I actually were told this story a couple of weeks ago. As, as you all may know, our, our graduate, Ken Thompson, uh, the district attorney of, of Brooklyn, passed very unexpectedly earlier this fall, and at his uh, funeral earlier this fall, uh, another graduate of ours, Hakeem Jeffries, Congressman Jeffries, was remembering Ken and remembered that uh, Ken, whenever speaking of uh, his heroes, um, whether they were uh, people in law or in politics and government and public life in any way. Um, Hakeem said, you would know if this was someone that Ken really th uh, thought extremely well of because he would always preface the person's name with the great, the great <laughs> Thurgood Marshall, the great uh, whoever else. And, uh, and of course, Hakeem said that we should all think of Ken Thompson that way, the great Ken Thompson. And I think both Ken and Hakeem would agree, and certainly we can all agree, that the great ought to permanently be added to the beginning of Judith Kay's name as well. Um, and if we were to add one more, um, it's something I, one of the first times I heard someone speak of Judge Kay um, on the basis of knowing her personally uh, was when I was clerking for Justice Ginsburg. Um, and it's an interesting thing. So it's true that the New York Court of Appeals is the ultimate authority on the New York Constitution. It's also true that those state law issues come to the Supreme Court of the United States sufficiently rarely that not many justices of the Supreme Court of the United States spend a lot of time reading the work of state high court judges. So if they spend a lot of time reading a particular judge's uh, a writing, it's not because they need to in the context of their work, it's because they want to because of the quality of the work. Um, and among the many people who is deeply expert in the jurisprudence of Judith Kay is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, and when she talked to me about some of those opinions and my other co-clerks, because they had something to do with a case we were working on, she always prefaced the name Judith Kay with the wonderful Judith Kay. And uh, I feel like tonight we've heard some ample justification for why to use that prefix as well. 
Thanks to all of you for being here this evening, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our wonderful panel.